Uh, good afternoon, my name's Andrew. I'm the co-founder of the Venus Project Design with my partner Julia, who's sitting over there. Uh, before I go into the more detailed presentation of the Venus Project Design and the uh, design of the Circular Cities, I'd just like to introduce the rest of the Venus Project Design team. So first of all we have Ben McLeish, just over here, who you spoke, spoke before? No, no. Uh, Ben's our lecturer. Uh, we've got Tom Williams, our event coordinator. So, uh, Jason Gleason, who is over at the back there doing the audio and visual. And Mark Whitner and Stuart Dobson, who couldn't be here today, they're our web developers. Uh, yeah, they developed the website that we've got up here. Um, the Venus Project design was created shortly after myself and Julia and my partner watched uh, Zeitgeist Addendum, uh, shortly after it was released, and um, realised that we could help out on the design side of things uh, for the Venus Project, as we both come from a computer-aided design background in the construction industry. Um, our initial goal was to create a global CAD agency that the Venus Project could use to develop up the construction drawings for the first TVP cities. Um, it later worked out really that we realised that unless we actually um, got the funding and the opportunity from a country to actually build one of these cities, um, it was pretty futile to actually try designing one um, at this time because by the time we actually get the opportunity to do a city, uh, the design will likely have changed by then, the technology will have changed by then, um, and it's, there's a, a lot of um, variables involved with the design of the cities um, that could change by that time. So we later developed the website um, to include a global scientific and technical database. Uh, we've now got around 1,500 people, I believe, on that database. Um, from everything from architects, engineers, um, neuroscientists, all the different scientists, uh, scientific fields. We've got technicians from all different fields um, that are signed up there so that if at some point in the future a country does decide to take on um, the Venus Project ideals and build the first city, we can then pull on that uh, database and bring the people in that local area or that local country uh, into the design of those first cities. Um, myself and my partner, we've also had a, a long-term interest in 3D computer-aided visualizations. Um, this is some of the stuff uh, in mid-process that we've been working on with the Venus project. Um, we, we also have a, a, a group of volunteers through the database that actually help us with the 3D modeling. So we're actually taking Jack's thousands of sketches um, and creating 3D models out of those for visualization purposes to show people what these cities may look like in the future. Okay, so having spent much time with Jack over the last few years developing his sketches uh, into 3D models and learning about the design principles he uses and why. Uh, I'd like to share some time with you of this today with a, a broader understanding of why uh, the cities look the way they do, why they're circular, why the buildings are white, um, many of the questions that are normally addressed, uh, especially I, I get a lot of this on Facebook, uh, <laughs> people grilling me for hours of uh, why things are the way they are, so we'll, we'll go into some of that now. Our current system of resource extraction is uh, transportation through to finalised manufacturing and production of goods and their transportation to the end user is actually extremely inefficient in our current system. It's wasteful and it's outdated. And when you consider 99% of all materials produced uh, in the US ends up in a landfill within six weeks, every tonne of garbage dumped takes five tonnes of material resources to produce. Uh, the waste in our current system is quite clearly out of control. And when you add into the mix that the cost of importing and ex exporting these goods all over the globe and the inherent pollution that is caused within this system, um, it's quite clear this is just a complete failure on all levels. Uh, and we can't continue to do this if we want to survive on this planet. The Venus Project cities are not built for architectural ego. Uh, and hence we need to be evaluated on a different set of criteria than we're used to. 
that of actual functionality. It's not something that architects are taught in our current schools. Just as we try to identify the root causes uh, in our social ills within the Venus Project, we also need to understand the root causes of why we have the problems in the cities that we do currently. Um, so we can understand the actual reasoning behind why uh, Jacques designs the cities the way he does. The industrial areas outside, uh, are outside of the city and where possible a self-contained resource, extraction and distribution nodes with on-site production, design, manufacturing and production facilities all rolled into one. Connected via a maglev, maglev freight trains to the main city hubs for delivery of goods produced while reducing pollution in the city hubs dr uh, drastically whilst util utilising a, a monorail passenger transport system between local city hubs, uh, the pollution is almost completely annihilated from what our current system is. By having the design and manufacturing facilities located together at the same site, combined with on-site resource storage facilities, a huge amount of energy and efficiency is saved. And when you add to this the fact that transportation of material resources and finished goods is handled by maglev trains, by clean renewable energies, and the removal of unnecessary shipping and transportation of those resources from the source of extraction to the manufacturing plants, the effect of intercity traffic would be immense. Not to mention the huge saving of both human and labour resources. Where possible, all goods produced would be biodegradable or recyclable. And for example, in the case of electronic goods, these would be designed with each individual component being upgradable, utilising standardised parts and connectors, reducing the amount of waste and technology improves. Products become outdated and when, the cons and when you consider the various options we have for creating natural plastics, for example, palm oil or hemp oil, for example, as well as genetically engineered plastics, our reliance on, on you know, our current oil is you know, almost completely wiped out. Um, the only reason we still use oil now is for the profits incentive because it's just, it's not profitable to invest into renewable energies at this time. Many people initially see Jack's work and think to themselves, it's just a fantasy, it's a big utopian dream, you know. Um, the buildings all look like something from Star Trek. Um, never happen. They don't look at the purpose behind the architecture. And it's very difficult for um, us to present um, the architecture in the way that Jacques has designed it in one book or one video. Um, it's important for us, if we are serious about conserving the resources of our planet, that we understand that the function must become the dominant value over aesthetics. Even though this is very difficult for many due to our current indoctrination into our materialistic and wasteful consumerist aesthetic culture. The circular arrangement of the city needs less energy and materials in transportation of goods and services and people. Also, it's easier to make an inbuilt transportation system in a circular system. The routing of transportation is linear and radial and therefore more efficient. You don't need traffic lights everywhere. You don't need roundabouts everywhere. Much of the transportation would be off the ground. The on-ground transportation would be for the emergency services to get to people if they have accidents or if someone's ill in their home, or, you know, etc. The transportation between city hubs would be for, uh, via maglev or monorail, depending on the distance. With the city being, also, with the city being designed um, in a circular arrangement, you only ever need to design one-eighth of the city. And then we array it to become a circular city. This would save a huge amount of time on the actual design process of creating these cities. The, standard, sorry, the standardization of buildings is a more efficient use of resources if we're serious about ma uh, minimizing waste and maximizing efficiency. For example, if you look at some of the buildings in London, depending on the level of the building, you have different size windows, you, have dis you, know, you, you might have uh, four or five glazed windows in a row and then a single one and then a double and then, you know, in order for us to produce those, we have to have different designs for them. It takes a different amount of materials for each of them to be, to be created. If we standardize those, it becomes a much more efficient process. 
becomes cheaper on resources, it's easier to make. Um, you know, we need to start thinking about the actual functionality of our cities, of our buildings, um, to take this into account rather than just looking at you know, how the building looks, whether it's aesthetically pleasing to my cultural values, which are different from your cultural values or yours. Many of the structures are dome shaped. The reason for this is that the dome structures are structurally stronger than current home types and won't collapse in cases of earthquakes. These buildings have more surface area for direct sunlight. We, uh, the reason they're white is because we, use, uh, we would be using a ceramic skin that would, be, would have embedded solar panel cell or solar cells um, so that the actual ho homes themselves are actually uh, self-generating homes. They generate their own electricity. Obviously, this would only be used in countries where there's uh, direct sunlight for most of the day. But they would also be um, combined with other energy sources within the city. So you'd have wind power, tidal power, depending on whereabouts the city was, uh, was built. Domes also uh, take less maintenance from the typical cuboid homes that we're used to. And due to the increased surface area, homes like this can easily generate their own heating and cooling. Uh, their own heating and cooling and house power. In countries where this is not enough, uh, not enough sunlight to do this, we would obviously use different technologies. Uh, heat source, heat exchangers, etc. Additionally, these structures are easily constructed using 3D printing technologies. As one continuously sealed mould with openings left for windows, although the latest in technology is uh, suggesting that within probably the next three or four years that we would actually be able to do 3D printing with multiple materials in the same mould. So you'd actually be building the house with the concrete and the, the windows all in one, all sprayed in, in the printer. Sorry. The, the current printers that we've got are, are typically table sized. Um, there aren't any, apart from the one in uh, California University, which is now they're now using to build complete brick walls with the um, services inside the actual walls. There's no reason, apart from the money tree reason, of why we can't make these machines absolutely huge. They could be the size of this room, for example, printing off houses, traveling down tracks, you know, printing off complete you know, housing areas for these cities in a number of days rather than you know, several years as it would currently take with our current construction methods. <laughs> currently we conceive of homes within the restrictions of our habits and our indoctrination into our culture and architectural design of that, uh, and so styles of that culture. We consider it normal to live in a square brick and wood based house which often breaks over the course of its life requiring endless maintenance and is often flattened in major storm as we see year upon year especially in this country. My little friend Peanuts actually got something to say about the, uh, the current mindset of uh, buildings. Hey, Tina, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. There's a lot of 
of traffic out there. What's going on? It's 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Everyone left their house at the same damn time. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> Call me back at 5.30. I'll tell you the same thing. <laughs> Only guess what? They're going the other way. <laughs> Okay, so we still think it's perfectly normal to have these in our homes, stairs. Why? <laughs> they're spatially inefficient, they're dangerous. I mean, why do you have uh, a rail at the top to stop your kids falling down them? It's just nonsense. People over a certain age can't even use them. Homes are clearly not currently designed to be lived in. <laughs> but hey, as long as they look good. It, it seems normal, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's even considered traditional and beautiful that, you know, for many, um, a mind shaped by this culture. In time to come, as values and attitudes towards the intelligent and sustainable management of the world's resources change, we won't be thinking the same way we are now. That's pretty clear. The homes that Jacques designs... My partner wants that one. Uh, as seen in our latest 3D renderings, which you can see in the exhibition uh, next door. These houses are conceptual, but they are based on design criteria as laid out by the Venus Project. They only reflect what the houses of the future may look like. You're not, you're not going to be forced to live in this one if you don't like it. You know, it's, it, homes will be designed for you specifically, for your needs. Each home would be designed for the needs of the inhabitants of that home. For example, someone who loves cooking and hosting dinner parties, for example. They might want a large kitchen and a big dining room. Um, not everyone would want that. You know, I'm a bit of a computer nerd. I like to sit behind my computer doing my 3D animations and stuff. You know, this is all quite daunting for me. I'm not really a good cook. Um, not big on dinner parties. Getting better. <laughs> so that kind of home would not suit me. I'd like something with a study where I can do my robotics and play around with my computers and things like this, you know. Um, so it's quite clear that we all have our own individual needs based on our own individual personal habits, our own individual personal desires, things that we like to do, our hobbies, etc. So our homes really need to be designed with that in mind. Um, and you can't standardise that. You know, you can't, you can't carry on standardising homes based on the region that you live in. If you look at, if you look at the homes in South Kent, they all look the same. You know, there's, there's mild variations, but they're all done by the same architects in the same areas. They've learnt the same styles of that area, you can't actually, in most um, counties, you can't actually get a house designed that is that different from everyone else's because it will look, you know, out of place in, in the local area. The council will not let you, you know, give, will not give you planning permission for that. Many people will also um, move house much more often, no longer having the burden of having to own vast amounts of luggage household appliances with short lifespans and trapped by mortgages or rent. And with much less per required due to access abundance, no more removal vans. No more breaking your back, you know, lifting your sofa downstairs to move to your... No more headaches that come, you know, with all that <laughs> moving all your gear. It's a, it's, a, it's a nightmare. It's supposed to be one of the most stressful things that we ever do in our lives. And yet we do it quite frequently, apparently. It's bizarre. Current homes are not designed for function, but are standardised based on current architectural trends in the area at that time. This is why house hunting can be such a laborious task in this system, because you're looking for a home that suits... There has never been one designed specifically for them. 
So you go around various different homes and you say, oh, this one's quite nice, it's got a bigger dining area, it's great for me, I'm a cook, you know, and your, your missus says, yeah, but you know, I like my computers and I want a little study and I haven't got a study in this house. So then you move on to your next one and eventually you find something that's, you know, it's there or thereabouts. It's, it's, yeah, it's got character, it's nice, I think we'll go with that home. But it still was never designed to meet your personal needs. I love these things. <laughs> Awful, aren't they? Home extensions. These are classic. This is a prime example of how homeowners attempt to make their homes more suitable for their own needs when they clearly wasn't in the first place. You simply wouldn't need to do this if the home was designed with your needs in mind before construction. Something that often comes up as a criticism of our ability to technologically develop the circular cities, as proposed by Jacques Fresco, uh, is of the automated construction. It's, you know, well, these big machines don't exist now, so therefore we can't make the cities, which means the Venus project doesn't work, so let's go back to communism, or whatever. Um, the truth is that our construction methods at the moment especially in the Western world, are actually quite well developed. There's no reason why these cities could not be built with our current construction methods. Whether or not they're actually designed, constructed, uh, and used on the first city using these automated systems, it really doesn't matter. The, the automated systems would likely be developed in the first resource-based economy city, or first TVP city, um, that's something that would be a, a development project for building the next cities. So it's not a requirement, you know. In 2007, global food production was 8.5 trillion kilograms, or about 1.3 million kilograms per person. In 2007, the average American consumed 1,000 kilograms, and we have an obesity epidemic. Strange that. This implies that in 2007 we produced enough food to feed every man, woman and child 1,000 times over, yet nearly, one million, oh, sorry, yet nearly 1 billion people are starving. We don't have an overpopulation problem on this planet. We have a resource management, allocation and distribution problem. To be blunt, we have a... To be blunt, we have a technical and political problem, and there's no sign of this problem being solved in any other way than what we're advocating. This problem is global and affects everything from food supply to fresh water su supply to housing to clean renewable energies and even education. There is absolutely no logical reason with the technology that we have available to us today that we cannot provide all of these things as a basic human right instead of something that you have to earn. We could do so easily we have our current technologies. We will use the best technologies available to us at the time of design, whatever they may be at that time. Not simply those with the largest amount of existing profit or money demand. For energy supply, we would, be, we would use renewable energy systems such as solar, geothermal, volcanic, wind, wave, tidal, etc. These are all proven technologies and as yet unadopted because of, uh, of the might of the economies of, uh, sorry, of the might of the economies and scale presently favouring oil and gas, and even the technologically simple coal industry. It's still running. Why? If you look at the current building construction, um, a typical high-rise office building can take from several months to a couple of years from preliminary design to finished construction drawings. Consisting of multiple companies such as architects, civil engineers, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, CAD technicians, project managers, and many, many more professions. That's just on the design side. You've then got to build the thing. In the system under which we currently live, those designers have families. They've got bills to pay, they've got rent to pay, they've got mortgages, they've got uh, you know, food bills, they've got electricity bills, they've got all the problems that you and I have that keep us going to work from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, some of us Saturday and Sunday as well. The reason we haven't done the full designs for any of these cities so far is twofold. 
One, we don't have the funding to be able to take on full-time teams of architects, engineers, CAD technicians, etc. to work five days a week, eight hours a day, to produce these drawings for the first city, which could take several months to a couple of years. Secondly, until we know actually where we're going to be building these cities, until we know what land we've got, what resources we've got in the local area, until we know what human resources we've got, how much funding we've got for technology, etc., it's almost impossible for us to actually take them past the visualization stage at the moment. The transition. This is the favorite question of anyone new to the movement and many of those within it. The truth is there is no single answer to the question of how will the transition play out. Until we know the actual conditions that we're facing at the time of this direction to be taken on board by a particular nation or group, or, 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 sorry, or, or group of nations, the variables involved in determining the most efficient and smooth transition from the monetary system to a resource-based economy are dynamically related to the conditions of the economy, of the existing infrastructure, of the location of transitioning countries, the resources available to them, the current debt obligations of those countries, and many, many other factors that would have to be analyzed and considered in developing a specific transitional approach. So until we actually get to a point where we've got a mass following, where we can actually force the arm of a government or a series of governments, nations, into a position where they're actually going to listen and, 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 and discuss a resource-based economy, there's very little we can do as far as the transition is concerned. There's so many variables involved in this transition, and it's never been done before. There has never been a transition from a monetary system to a non-monetary system. It's been done the other way around. Before, you know, 10, no, before a few thousand BC, there was no barter or trade. It was all hunter and gatherer societies and then we began the monetary systems. It's never been done the other way around, and it's not something that we've got a precedent that we can say, well, this is how we're going to go, go ahead and do it. That said, there is one thing that is abundantly clear. The current monetary market paradigm is coming to an end, and it will be replaced with an economic system that is based on the available resources of this planet. That said, we would rather it that it's one on access abundance, cooperation, clean environments, and harmony with nature, and not one based on competition and indifference or advantage. Our biggest obstacle, really, is that we don't get to enough people, and that, that the, the countries around this world end up falling back into one of the older you know, uh, paradigms, whether it be communism or socialism or fascism or whatever. It's, this is why this movement is so important. It's why I'm so glad to see so many of you here today because this message is actually getting out there and it's getting out there all over the world and it's the only way we are going to transition out of this system. In the transition, the problems that exist at the time will determine what will be done and where the resources will be allocated. People who volunteer to be in the first cities will be assigned to what is needed. We have inherited very poor conditions and uh, many disasters that have to be overcome and the resources we have to at the time will go towards resolving these urgent matters. People working with us at the beginning will be working on these problems that have to be resolved towards our stated goals. People will be serving under those who have specialised skills in certain areas. A list of professionals that are needed will be posted, but people will be trained as generalists as well. I think we can all agree that no one wants a carpet fitter to do your neuro uh, medical surgery. Stanley knives in the brain, not good. The standard of living will be constantly updated for all, but in the beginning, scarce resources will be shared. For instance, someone may donate their lawnmowers. Um, oh, what did I do? That's good. That's good. 
So for instance, someone may donate their lawn mowers. Uh, instead of everyone mowing their lawns with their own individual mowers and needing a mower, there may be only need to be a certain number to take care of the entire city. Who's going to mow your lawn? Well, I know a lot of people that love gardening and would be more than happy to spend their whole day in the city mowing lawns and treating gardens and God knows what else. People themselves decide what materials they'll use, what they'd like to work with in regards to their personal use. But ultimately, it is the availability of these materials that determines this. For example, if someone suggests that every roof made out of, uh, sorry, that every roof is made out of titanium, since it doesn't readily rust, then the availability of, and use would be determined by surveys done. Updated surveys are done as to how much titanium we have, the amount of resources needed to extract it, and then other materials available that would work, uh, sorry, are there other materials that are available? Are there other materials in development that could actually be used in replacement that are more abundant? It's the scientific method used to determine what materials we use, when we use them, how we use them, rather than someone's opinion, especially politicians. <laughs> Where there are scarce resources, people will be working on substitutes or composites to counteract these scarce items and come up with substitute materials that may even be more beneficial, such as materials that serve many purposes for covering roofs while acting as heat concentrators as well. Before moving into the city, people would need to be orientated to how that city would work. How they acquire their goods, how they acquire services, how they can participate in research, their own projects or even activities that they may want to do. They're not under the dictate of anyone. People learn that they don't need to take more than they need and understand that if they if they do, it will just be a burden to themselves. If I go into Tesco's tomorrow and I take, I don't know, 20 trolleys worth of, worth of food and I take it home and I've got a small freezer and what am I going to do with 20 trolleys worth of food? It's just going to spoil in my house, it's going to rot and smell my house out. It's not a good idea, is it? I'm pretty sure none of you would go home with 20 trolleys of uh, food. Apart from Ben, maybe. Ben, ben probably would. <laughs> People will learn they don't need to take more than they need and understand it will be a burden. So although during the transition there will be those who have remnants of past behaviours and you know, the job is to, prevent, uh, is to present more appropriate values to carry out the new social direction to enhance their lives and others. This is why in the movement our, our, prime really, our real prime goal is to change the values of people um, because these val the, the values that are existing in our current system would cause havoc in a resource-based economy. Okay, so future projects and how you guys can help. The next major step for the Venus project, as far as the transition is concerned, and you can find this information on their website, is that they would like to create a major motion picture for worldwide release in the mainstream, mainstream cinemas to inform large numbers of people globally about the benefits of living in a resource-based economy and how we can tr transition from our current paradigm. Whilst we understand that the Zeitgeist movement does not itself advocate the use of money to further its goals on activism and the like, it is still down to certain individuals within certain chapters, etc that have made events like this possible. Something like this costs many thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds to put deposits down for. Those deposits don't exist before the tickets are bought. So what tends to happen is certain coordinators or groups of people within the movement dig into their pocket and they pay the deposits and they just hope that they're going to break even at the end of the day. I can see a time where we're going to have to look at some means of funding for these events that is a little bit more efficient and less painful on certain individuals within the movement. The fact remains that as long as we are under this existing monetary system, without access to land, resources, scientific and technical products, 
the goods and services of those design professionals required to create a test city. This will require an enormous amount of funding within this current system. We don't have that funding currently. We intend to utilize cutting edge 3D within this, this, uh, this, this movie. Such companies as Weta Digital or Industrial Light and Magic, the kind of people that worked behind Avatar or Lord of the Rings, Star Wars for example. The worldwide profits from this major motion picture release would then be used to fund the research and development city and showcase the viability of the Venus project and a resource-based economy to the world's press. And next you'll see a short video from Jacques and Roxanne at the Venus project. Yes. We feel it's really important to do a major motion picture now to, to get to the general public, to introduce to them what science and technology can do under the direction of the Venus Project within a resource-based economy. I think a motion picture can be played over and over again. It can be translated into many different languages and it could do far more than my personal lectures because it travels all over the world. And in a motion picture, you can answer all the questions that people ask. We also feel while Jacques is still alive, he is the best person to put this film together. He has worked all his life to arrive at this direction. He hasn't just read books. He has experimented and worked with people and worked with technology and showed just how a resource-based economy can function and what it will look like. So to us, it's very important to have Jacques involved in this film. The basic ideas for the film are laid out precisely. And uh, they are laid out in accordance with the plans of the Venus Project. If you don't have a public prepared to accept the Venus Project, there is no other way. All of the future scenarios in science fiction films are, are detrimental, are scary, are technology overcoming and killing people, dictatorial governments and technology watching your every move. This is quite the opposite of the Venus Project for anybody who knows about it. And this is what we want to get across to the public that you don't have to be afraid of technology. We want to show how the methods of science can be used to enhance everyone's life and preserve the environment. If we spent the money any other way, I don't think it would be as effective. We need a large following to get this implemented. People don't know what's missing. They don't know any other system. So we want to show life in a resource-based economy, then show flashbacks of how we get from here to there, and do it in an entertaining way so we could bring the public along with it. The Venus Project story is already fairly explicit. And what we need, perhaps, of a writer is putting it in terms that might be easily understood or acceptable. It will have a lot of CGI in it, which is expensive because it does take place in the future. But it depends on when and what kind of funds we get that will dictate, say, the, the type of script. But we feel now is the time to have the Zeitgeist members get behind this if they want to see a better world, if they want to see a, a transition that may not be as, as painful. The film would help in that way to make an easier transition. The more funding, the more elaboration. That depends on what people do to help support the project. If we're going for donations for this film, then it would be totally transparent. We would have information on the internet as to how much has come in, where it's going to, and we have to do this because we're aiming to get the donations through our nonprofit 501c3 organization called Future by Design. And lawfully, everything has to be transparent, and it would be. If we do make a profit, we will build the first city, or we will do additional films, shorter films, but many of them. People will walk out of this film with a definite direction to work towards, and knowing the difference between what they have today and the possibilities of the future within a resource-based economy. We want them to understand it so much so they walk out and say, why don't we live like this today? Uh, 
Okay, finally, I'd just like to draw your attention to our various current ongoing projects and how you can get involved with them. Firstly, there's our global scientific and technical database. This database is for professionals in scientific and technical fields to register as future volunteers that could be called upon if and when TVP cities are first uh, designed. Next is our production of 3D models of Jacques' thousands of designs and concept sketches for use in visualizations, movies, and other media. If you have experience in 3D modeling and computer generated uh, 3D graphics, we'd like you to assist us in this huge ongoing project. I'll probably be about 95 by the time I get finished with all these sketches. Uh, you can email us at mail at thevenusprojectdesign.com. We do have some business cards, I believe, um, that we can hand out. Uh, also, check out our website, thevenusprojectdesign.com. There's lots of videos on there about current technologies, etc. It's quite an entertaining site, if I say so myself. Um, as a final note, following on from our successful exhibition in Eindhoven last year, we have reproduced as much of the exhibition that we did there as possible, um, minus the live 3D walkthrough of our first city model that was present in Eindhoven. Um, we just didn't have the money for the software for that, which was about 10,000 euros. Um, however, all of the latest 3D renders uh, our team and volunteers have produced are on show in the exhibition next door. So I hope you all enjoy that and thank you for listening. I'm sorry.